up at the end pick that up white stripes the brother and sister remember they had that shit going there <laughs> okay who believes it right the blood the brother and sister ah they're not brothers and sisters they they were they were uh married <laughs> jack white and um and uh the chick whatever her name is meg <laughs> meg white <laughs> were were they met in a bar and they were in a band and they got married and they try to say they were brothers and sisters. So Mark Scott reporting. Do a little riff on the news today. Day after Christmas was still here. God damn. Hope you guys had a good time. Uh, doing whatever you do. If you like me, you kind of like go off into the, off into the nothingness. Go off into the, uh, into the quiet. And I seek out the quiet while people seek out the noise, and the the uh, I guess the contact with others. I go into the abyss. <laughs> The bliss, the bis, whatever. So um, let's start out with some stories. I got a lot of stories piling up. I wanted to. I, I haven't been doing, haven't been riffing the news lately. So let's look here. So Trump. We'll start with uh, Roger Stone. Trump says uh, he hasn't thought about pardoning Roger Stone. Let's listen to what he says. So Roger Stone uh, is the you know conspiracy kook, the guy in, involved with um, Infowars. Right? He's kind of made inroads into the. The uh, smaller truth community with uh, Jerome Corsi and such. I reached out. To, I never reached out to Roger Stone, but I did reach out to Corsi once, and he never. <laughs> I tried to interview him. He never answered my my emails. I I've never even spoken to any of these people, but nonetheless, Pro uh, President Trump is definitely talking about Roger Stone, who was convicted of six or seven felonies, lying to Congress and such. And uh, will Trump pardon him? Because tr because Roger Stone did work on Trump's campaign uh, in the very early stages. So let's listen to Trump. Uh, Roger Stone, are you going to pardon him, sir? He's been convicted of felonies. Am I going to pardon him? Yes. Well, I hadn't thought of it. Uh, I think it's very tough what they did to Roger Stone compared to what they do to other people on their side. I think it's very tough. I think it's a very tough situation that... Uh, they did something like that. You know, Roger Stone was not involved in my campaign in any way, other than the very, very beginning before, I think I, long before I announced a little bit. I've known Roger over the years. He's a nice guy. A lot of people like him. And he got very, he got hit very hard, as did General Flynn, and as did uh, a lot of other people. That got hit. That's not really true, because Roger Stone was, in fact, a, uh, you know, working with, uh, Ro work, working with Corsi, working with, Alex Jones to promote Trump well after he had announced he had already clinched a nomination and so did Hillary Clinton. They were running side by side and Roger Stone was actively campaigning uh, for Trump. Does that make Trump, does that make Roger Stone a, a uh, you know, confederate or a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a, um, a surrogate of Trump? Not really, but nonetheless, um, that's what's going on. So essentially, you got the president of the United States uh, regarding Roger Stone saying that that Roger Stone got a bad deal. So I would say that Roger Stone should have his fingers crossed right now that Trump loses in 2020. And on the way out during the lame duck session, he pardons Roger Stone because <laughs> if Trump gets reelected, Roger Stone could be sitting in the can till 2000. 24, right? I don't think he would. The presidents usually do their pardoning on the way out. So, uh, good luck. Good luck, Roger. That's what happens when you lie to Congress. Think you're a tough guy, right? So, let's look at another tough guy. Michael Avenatti. Avenatti. You remember this guy? He was the, rep he was the guy who represented um, uh, Stormy Daniels, right? Another, another president hater, right? And he was so cool. He was going to even run for president, idiot, right? Now I'm going to run for president. Nobody's going to beat me. I'm going to run for president. I'll beat Trump. I'll beat Trump. And so this guy played his hand way, way too, too open. Michael Avenatti was $15 million in debt during Nike extortion, uh, extortion feds. The more important part of the story is that his trial begins next week. And the feds don't look like they're fucking around. 
Luxury-loving lawyer Michael Avenatti was $15 million in debt uh, when he tried to extort Nike. Uh, ma- uh, Manhattan federal prosecutors charged in new court papers. The government expects that the evidence at the trial will show that at the time uh, of his charged conduct, the defendant was in significant debt. Now, that's not really a big deal. Right, he was uh, he was obviously in debt on paper, and he was driving. He had a brand new uh, a jet. He's flying around in a private jet. He's got a brand new car, brand new Ferrari, a Porsche. Right? He's living on on living large on other people's uh, uh, coin. Now, the reality of Michael Avenatti is not only was he a a dickhead in the press and a a um, you know a conspirator to overthrow the president of the United States using a hooker. Stormy Daniels, but he was he was a uh, a lawyer ripping off his clients. I, he would he would take like a, a personal injury case and sue for five million dollars, win the case, and then take the five million dollars, put it in his pocket, and say fuck you to the victim. Uh, that's really why he's he's such a scumbag, and um, probably deserves to go down. So hopefully we'll see him. Avenatti became a household name after he reaped. Uh, re porn star Stormy Daniels, whose real name is Stephanie Clifford, in her in her lawsuit against President Trump to invalidate a non-disclosure agreement she signed after they allegedly had an affair. Uh, so that's who Avenatti is. Maybe we'll see him tumble. Right? So here's a here's a story that's close to home for me. Literally, the bridge that I'm always uh, talking about down the block. Right, safety fences installed on Verrazano Bridge amid spat in suicides. Now, this story came out right before Christmas, and I had reached out to um, to this the city councilman in the area to ask him what the hell is going on here, right? And uh, he didn't respond, so I'll go ahead and just talk about the story. I was waiting for the guy to call, Justin Brannon, local, local uh, guy, and uh, he didn't respond. I wanted to interview him on Skype. So, uh, Brand- Mr. Brannon, if you're listening, uh, you know, give me a call. The MTA has uh, installed 100 feet of safety fencing along the Verrazano Bridge, the first of 28,000 feet it plans to erect amid calls for stronger suicide prevention measures there. What the hell is going on that we have to build a fence on the bridge to prevent people from jumping? Think, Think about what the story is saying, that... That because it's such a large bridge, it's 250 feet off the water in the highest spot. It's freezing cold. You hit the water, it's like hitting cement. You splat. You don't go. You don't go in. You go, <laughs> and you fucking splat on the top of the water. Uh, and it, it's just it's just a sign of the times. Right? It, it brings the analogy. You know when you when you say um, a guy is walking, 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 and his feet hurt. He's walking. You know when when. Way back in the day, the caveman's walking, you know, uh, on his way somewhere, and his feet are killing him. And he says, maybe we should cover the whole earth with rubber. Let's cover the whole earth with rubber. And then someone comes along and, and with a pair of shoes and says, here, put these on. Put the shoes on. They have rubber on it. You don't have to cover the whole world with rubber because your feet hurt. Uh, you could cover your own feet. It just makes me wonder about the state of our state of our our being in America you know people want to jump you know right around Christmas time they've already had the article says that um, three people have already jumped this month alone now I see it because I I live over here and sometimes I see the boat right? it's it's a it's basically you'll see a, it's a NYPD boat and you'll see it sitting there and then you'll see the helicopter like in the picture I hear that helicopter from my house literally I could hear it from where I, you know, because I'm, I'm right next door to the bridge. Uh, and and uh, it, it's just a crazy idea that we have to worry. We have to build giant fences. I think they already did it in um, San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge. And, you know, build these fences to prevent, uh, you know, people on the balls of their ass at the end of their, their life cycle thinking, I, gotta, I, gotta, I, I don't see any other way. And they jump off the... Uh, it, I think that what, what I'm trying to say is I think it speaks more to the state of the psychology, the, the, psych, the, the psyche of American people and the, uh, the, the wanting to kill yourself by jumping off a bridge. 
and that we have to build a fence to prevent you from doing it. So that's something to think about. So fake polls, right? I've been saying all along, fake elections, fake polls. It turns out that after the last uh, debate on December 19, where it looked, you know, seven candidates on stage, looked like it looked like the numbers of viewers was going down from 10 million down to 6 million. Uh, people were losing interest in it. Joe Biden is floundering. Uh, Elizabeth Warren is floundering. Pete Buttigieg got his ass handed to him. And Bernie Sanders is still there. After all this time, Bernie Sanders is still there. So where is the poll that says Bernie Sanders is surging? There is no poll, right? So what's, in, what's interesting about the poll is that there is no recent polls. This is, this is December 26th. The last poll was December 20. Right after a, right after a, a debate, you don't, you don't do polls to see if they moved? Talk about a rig. Look at this shit. All right, so all the polls, every day, poll, 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 two a day sometimes. The 12th, the 13th, the 15th, the 16th, the 17th, the 18th, the 19th, the 20th. Nothing after that. Six days in a row without any fake polls. Right? Are the polls so, uh, so unbalanced that they can't even rig them anymore? And, and it's, it's Sanders all the way and they just won't say it? Going into Iowa? Well, that's what I think. But, uh, you know, I could be wrong, right? I could be wrong. So let's look at uh, moving right along. This is Tessa Mage's story, right? Tessa Mage is the chick that got stabbed to death in Morningside Park up in Harlem. The killer is still at large. The killer, Tessa Mage's suspected killer, believed to be hiding in the South. Ah. And what color is he? I told you. I told you it was... It was black teens beating up the rich white chick. I told you. So there he is, and he's still on the run, which is very unusual. How, how does a 14-year-old kid slip out, slip out of town you know, with the NYPD? So the story is that the parent was driving the kid in Harlem to, 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 quest, to be questioned. Right? He's, a, he's a suspect in the murder. The kid, the 13-year-old that they already have uh, in custody, Gave this kid up, gave up his name, and so the kid is still on the run. But you, you got to ask yourself, how does this, how does a, you know, a thirteen-year-old or fourteen-year-old kid escape without ease, right? You know, w- with such ease, right? Because in New York, there's only a couple of ways to get out. You got to, it, it has to be assisted. Somebody had to have driven him to wherever the hell he went, right? because if he would have tried to, you know, do the the budget way and take the Chinatown bus to Philly or Washington D.C. or even further south to Atlanta, he would have gotten busted. They would have, they would have caught him. Those, guarantee those buses and trains were being watched. So the bottom line is that somebody assisted this kid at, at, uh, at escaping. Now, they, the initial story, just interesting thought, is that the initial story was they, were, they really were pot dealers. They were young pot dealers. And with that, sometimes comes a little bit of criminal protection. And you remember the initial story was that the kids, they, that there was a blood trail that led back to the uh, projects by, uh, the Grant, by Grant's tomb at all over 125th Street. Right? So it is likely that if he did escape, drug dealers may have given him safe passage down south. Give him a car, give him a gun, give him a driver, you know what I mean? Put him in the, you know, sit in the trunk for nine hours and take him somewhere where uh, you can dump him off. So... The kid has thus far escaped. Will he surface? Can a 14-year-old kid, you know, if you know, escape the, the you know the heavy hand of the law for that long? I don't know. He's doing pretty good so far. So, so here's the main story that I wanted to talk about. So Notre Dame, right? Remember they said Notre Dame, Notre Dame fire. Remember when Notre Dame burned? Let's look at the video. I think they got a video here. The Post got a video. You remember the day? Let's take a stroll back fire lane. So you remember when Notre Dame burned and the, uh, it was in the height of the yellow vest? The yellow vest movement, people thought that maybe some yellow vest snuck over there and, and threw a cocktail bomb into Notre Dame and burned it to the ground to make a statement, though never proven. Uh, it, it, we still don't know the cause of the fire. Most people say that it was arson. Uh, but the the um, people that did the investigation claimed that it was an accident, that somebody flicked the cigarette butt and the butt caught onto wood that was petrified 
of stone that couldn't have burned no matter what, even with a fucking blowtorch could have burned. But somehow uh, that, that, that cigarette butt caused the burning. Now, do we believe that? No, I think it was clearly arson. I think that, uh, yeah, it's old wood and such, but uh, nonetheless, there it is, burning. So the, the big story here is, can they save it? What's left of it? Right. Now, is it worth saving? Yeah, it's, you know, a thousand years old, a thousand years old, however many years old. Is it worth saving? Do they want to save it? Yeah, they want to save it, but is it possible? So here's the wreckage. Let's look at the, uh, let's, 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 let's uh, read. The rector of Notre Dame uh, Cathedral in Paris has admitted there is still only a 50-50 chance the, fi the fire ravaged landmark can be saved. Now, they told us a long time ago that all, you know, a couple of million dollars or a billion dollars can save it. But now they're changing their tune. They might have to knock it down because it might not be safe. So uh, Monsignor Patrick Chavet said he is already suffering heartache uh, because April's blaze meant that the 12th century cathedral was unable to hold Christmas services for the first time in more than 200 years. But he said he is bracing for even more potential distress after the church's, supporters, su church's support scaffolding is removed, likely in 2021. The officials learn whether the structure's surviving vaults are strong enough to keep the Gothic monument standing. Today, it is not out of danger. Uh, Shavat said the beloved landmark, uh, speaking on Christmas Eve, before midnight mass is in, in a nearby church. Today we can say there may be a 50% chance that it will be saved. There is also a 50% chance of scaffolding falling onto the three vaults, he said. So, as you can see, the building is very fragile. The 855-year-old landmark was under renovation when fire ravaged it in April, destroying its roof and collapsing its spire, spear. Without a roof to keep it stable, the vulnerable vaults are uh, crucial to keep it standing. So, so that's very interesting, right? That's pretty interesting, Mark's County reporting. This, uh, so the, the cathedral is not out of danger, and they may have to knock it down because if they start building, it's like, you know, the, uh, it's like building in, on sand. Eventually it'll crumble. Eventually it'll collapse, and you can't, you know, you can't have that, right? You'd be sitting in St. Patrick's Cathedral after it burned, and you're sitting in there after the renovation, and the roof comes down on you because the walls themselves were not able to support itself. So, so can they build a new you know, St. Patrick's Cathedral with some relics in there? Yeah, of course. But can they save the structure? And it appears that, it appears that, that, might, not be, that might not be the case. That might not be the case. Marks Conti reporting. While you're here, become a Patreon of this channel. Kindly share these videos. Subscribe to my Marcus Conti News channel. By I'm gonna I'm gonna wait till the end of the year, January. We need to get over 1,000. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 1,000 uh, uh, subscribers so that the channel can be monetized. I think we're about 750, 800. So go to that channel. Kind the link is down below. Kindly share. Kindly share it. And um, and. Uh, Okay, so let's get over a thousand videos. What do you reckon it right? Hurry, hurry! Cause I care who love is dead!